So how many of your patients are exhibiting some, some hair loss? Yeah, some of us, especially after the stress that we saw this last year, right? So I do have a lot of conflict of interest, but not necessarily with anything in this topic, but we do a lot of research for different companies, so I think that's the important part here. I wish we were getting paid by all these people, but most times it's they'll give you something for six months, let you test it for them, give an idea how to utilize it properly, and then take it away. So what are our hair loss statistics? We know it's something that's important to all of us, and what we do realize is as we mature, both men and women, we experience some hair loss. And so the question becomes, what can we do to address this and help it, especially what's new in 2021? Well, we understand that hair loss is multifactorial, and the most important part is to understand how stress really affects hair loss because we know more and more now and we have better tools. I love Dr. Harper's talk because those are all three ingredients that we use in cosmeceuticals within our office. I think each one of those has good potency and in the right clinical setting can enhance what you're doing from a medical aspect in dermatology. When we look at this, if you want to take a picture of something, this is one of those slides where it shows you everything if you just blow up that right aspect. And it's talking about the different effects that we're seeing with stress. What we know is when there's stress, there's going to be release from the pituitary. We're going to have this um, adrenal access that gets activated. All of this affects different things. The gut. So gut flora, and from there, what ends up happening with our nutrients and what are we able to actually absorb? So that makes a big difference in what we see in the end organs. And those end organs, of course, you know that we treat on a daily basis are gonna be skin, hair, nails, lips, and oral mucosa. When you look at this chart, the thing that you have to remember is really to understand when there's this increased stress, you release more cortisol. The problem with being in such a stressful situation for the past year, year and a half, is that we have utilized too much of our cortisol. And our HPA axis, hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, isn't able to continue to keep up with this. And classically, we call this a flight or flight. Uh, no, excuse me. Flight? No. What is it? We, we flee. Flight or fright. Something like that, whatever it is. Listen, this English is a second language. You're going to have to excuse me here, right? Uh, so when we talk about that access, we're utilizing that cortisol. And the question then becomes, what is this doing for our hair? Well, I'm going to tell you a secret. It's making our hair gray, number one, and it's making our hair fall out. So if you look at presidents, there's something called the Marie Antoinette syndrome. Every president has continued to gray extensively over that four years. Take a look at any of the pictures of Obama, where he came in with a full set of dark hair and ended up with gray hair. Hmm, looks similar here. What we know is with this neurogenic pathway here is that we're releasing the CRH, the cortico uh, corticotropin releasing hormone, within the actual hair follicle itself. And that's something that we didn't realize. So more and more research is being done. And we see that this HPA axis is actually within each hair follicle. So the question then becomes, should we be doing things that are more topical? Should we do something else that's gonna affect the, um, that local aspect of the hair? There's something called immune privilege, and if you haven't read about this, it's something that's exciting to see. And what we know is that there's certain anatomical areas, including the hair follicle, the central nervous system, eyes, testes, and the hair follicle, that are gonna be in this immune privileged area, meaning they're more protected. What we also know is that there's gonna be something called substance P, which you all know about, and that's gonna be released locally that's gonna then dysregulate this hair growth and hair growth cycle. And so it's all about understanding what stress can do to the hair, and that leads to growth arrest, right? Apoptosis then gets formed, uh, gets uh, signaled, and then you're gonna have follicular regression. And so we see this over and over and over. So the question then becomes, how do we change that HPA axis? How do we decrease, in some cases, the uh, cortisol level? Or in some cases, how do we produce more cortisol to continue that balance and the proper balance? And so with stress, if you look at how it affects the various systems, all of this is gonna be related to the end organs that we're talking about, which is hair, skin, and nails. We also talk about the stress gut. 
And what does that do? With increased stress, you're gonna have increased gut permeability and you're gonna have decreased proper absorption of some of the things that we're prescribing within our clinics for these patients. When you have decreased nutrient absorption, then you're gonna have more deficiency in your hair itself. So the question then, of course, is what all of us wanna know. All right, you told me all this nonsense. What can I do about it? Well, there's a few things that we can do. We know that there's hair transplant, and even with hair transplant, we have to understand how can we prep, how can we fertilize that scalp properly? What can we do within our clinics if you're not doing hair transplant in your clinic? Right? We have uh, minoxidil, we have finasteride, we have a combination of those two, and we have low level of light. And again, just like Dr. Harper, I'm a skeptic. Are these things gonna work? Do they work better in combination? And so there was a publication that just got uh, sent out, I think it was this month's July 2021. Um, it's in either JDD or Derm Surge. I read all this nonsense on the plane, so they all get jumbled. So we take this multifactorial approach. How can we decrease the stress and how can we change that conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone inside the end organ, which is the hair follicle? How can we decrease the oxidative stress and improve our circulation and nutrition? And one of those is something called stress adaptogens. And we're studying this more because this publication, one of these publications is just from 2020 in January. And so it was actually published in Science. So Science and Nature, those are one of the few two uh, publications that I actually want to get into. And we got Science uh, published one time, but hopefully Nature at some point in time. We know that these stress adaptogens can change how our body reacts to stress. And what is a stress adaptogen? Well, it's just an adjustment of what we're doing for our internal uh, balance. One of those stress hormones is, since, uh, is ashwagandha. And what we say is, okay, we have Amazon now, we have Whole Foods in a lot of places, we have Trader Joe's, can we go and just get some ashwagandha? You can. But there's a difference in something called sensorial ashwagandha. And this too is sold, but it's proprietary. And it's a question of what we can do with that uh, to change that HPA axis. And we know that this can decrease elevated cortisol. And it also, the reason that this is so special, because all ashwagandha can decrease the cortisol level, but with the sensorial ashwagandha, what we're finding is it can actually upregulate the production of cortisol in those who are not producing enough. Unique. What else can we do? Well, we have curcumin. And so curcumin, we, you guys all know about turmeric and turmeric and what it does for the gut. It can actually decrease inflammation in the gut and possibly decrease the amount of colon cancer or the incidence of colon cancer. And if you have one of the derivatives of this, which is curcumin, and this you can order on Amazon, you're gonna put all these together. And there's also some, some nutraceuticals that will have it all in one, one tablet. But curcumin is gonna actually decrease TGF beta as well as TGS alpha and interleukin one. And so what we're seeing is when you have decreased inflammation and you're using this in patients orally, we're finding that their joints improve, they are actually um, having less inflammation, the hair follicle, and this is done by biopsy studies. So we know there's something there. What else can we add? Saw palmetto. And I saw on this little app that we're, we all downloaded that somebody had asked about saw palmetto. Is it something that you have to test for? Because what is it doing? It decreases the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. So if it's put on topically, can we absorb it and make it to do something like that? Or do we have to take it orally? And so far the studies that we're seeing, and again, these are smaller studies, right? It's not huge pharma companies that have millions of dollars that they're gonna throw at it. They throw a couple of million, not tens of millions or hundreds of millions. And what they did show is that uh, when it's taken orally, when it's properly absorbed, and how do you make it properly absorbed? You have to increase the fat content at the same time that you're taking these tablets. And depending on which company that you're gonna use and which one has clinical trials and proper studies, you have to figure out, do you take one tablet, two, three, or four, and do you take it all at one time? So I can tell you that this is very, very dose dependent, and you do have to, if you, depending on which company you're using, you have to take what they recommend all in one stage. Does it matter if you take it in the morning or evening? Nope. But what we found is compliance actually improves if you take it in the morning. And what do you do? You take it either with yogurt, you can take it with the protein shake, do it something that has a little bit of fattiness. So it's gonna be something that you guys all know because you're using this with isotretinoin at the same time. Let's talk BS now, okay? Where do we call BS on these companies? Does tocopherol, which is vitamin E, orally do anything? If you're a vegan, 
<clears throat> if you tend to have any kind of dietary restrictions, it may possibly do something. Because again, tocopherol is just gonna be amino acids, or it's gonna be broken down in amino acids. It's the same thing that's questioned by us with patients. Should we take oral collagen? We haven't seen, we, we have one study that says maybe. The other three studies show it doesn't do a darn thing. So we don't know that answer yet. So when somebody comes to me with this marketing, I'm like, eh, sounds like BS. I, the, the respect level goes down when we're talking to that person. If we're using oral collagen or oral hyaluronic acid, does it make a difference? Not that we've seen from studies. Are they promoting it? Sure. Everybody wants something that's an, that's an HA, right? And what's my favorite HA? Anything I can inject into their face, because I know that it works. <laughs> okay, we already talked about ashwagandha, so that's done. So here's a case where all he was using, the only difference that he's done, this is a 60-year-old gentleman that actually came for other things, and I said, hey, do you mind if I put you in a trial and uh, we can see if it does anything? So um, he's using four tablets of one of these complexes, and you can see this is um, six months later. When do you start seeing that change uh, topically? And when do we see the hair that changes, both thickness as well as hair count? That's typically, uh, you start seeing an early uh, decrease in hair loss at six weeks, and we see most of the change starting at about three months, where you can see these little baby fine hairs coming usually around the temples. How about low level light? You see that even Costco, you know, this major company, is selling stuff for low level light. Does it work? The answer is yes. The question is, what's the best mechanism? Because we actually, I have a new cosmetic fellow, it's my first fellow that I, we finally took, and she, the only reason we have a cosmetic fellow now after 22 years of saying no is because she used my own motto against me. Back in high school, my friends used to ask, they're like, how did you end up with her? You know, I used to date a couple of pretty girls here and there. And I always said the same thing, persistence always beats resistance. So that's what this cosmetic fellow has done. So she convinced me to go ahead and do the fellowship, and we've tested, uh, she has her husband who has some hair loss. So he bought something called iRestore. And I said, why did you choose iRestore? Well, we did some, some research on Google and we found that it has this many uh, lights and they're using LED and so we thought that it would work. I said, but they have no clinical trials. They just have like marketing BS. They have people like me saying, oh yes, it works, it's amazing, you have a spokesperson. I said, the only st um, study that's actually been done where there's actual uh, blinded studies showing one versus another is this particular device. Company, I'm not gonna talk because it's CME talk, but it ha it's the only device in the world that has two wavelengths of light. One is a 620 and the traditional 660 nanometer. And so this is a 16 week uh, blinded investigator trial. This was actually done in Australia. And what it found is when you do both a 620 and a 660, you have a localized release of nitric oxide, production and release of nitric oxide. And you say, well, what, what's so important about that? Dentists have been using injectable nitric oxide for a long period of time. Why? Especially in the gums and especially in the scalp, we find that it increases blood flow, it causes neo, uh, neovascularization, which then leads to neocollagenesis uh, in that area. We also found that it's an anti-inflammatory. So with those, that should all at least theoretically improve what you're doing to the hair follicle. But it does one other thing inside the scalp. It affects that individual HPA axis and it decreases the conversion of testosterone to DHT locally. So all of those, at least they make sense. They have the proper mechanism, right? And so that's all this shows. And it does have a dose-dependent conversion. So with this particular device, when you're using both the 620 and 660 nanometer, what we found is you have to use it 85% of the time to make it effective. And the nice part is, with this particular device, you have a app, and so it tracks you. And do I have one of these? 100% I do. I brought it with me to Vegas. It's my little carry-on that I've got in a bag, and I am at 96% activity. The three days that I missed, two were because we had a big freeze in Houston. I forgot to put the damn thing on. And then, oh, I'm sorry, I missed four days. And two, because it was just past midnight, so it counts as the next day. It doesn't let you do it twice. What we found is there's a seven times uh, increase in the endogenous nitric oxide that's there uh, compared to a standard 660. And again, do the number of lights matter? Not necessarily. As long as you have even application, it shouldn't make any difference. The, and the next question that comes back from this is, does it make difference whether you use LED versus laser? Only because LEDs tend to be lighter, and so it's a little bit more comfortable if you're choosing one of these devices to, to purchase. 
So when we saw this comparison, I think the interesting part is they compared it against minoxidil as well as finasteride. And what they showed is there's increased hair growth um, in a shorter period of time compared to both minoxidil as well as finasteride. So there's something to it. And again, uh, that's just placebo. But here's some clinical trial pictures and you can get an idea. Here's a male patient after 16 weeks. There's improvement. You know, my favorite is when people are posting on, um, on the social media that they're like, oh, look at all this hair growth. I'm like, well, the hair is so much longer. That person hasn't had a haircut. So what we do definitely do is we make sure that somebody is um, coming in. I ask them to come one week after their haircut when we take their baseline photographs, and then we bring them back at that one week mark after their next haircut so we can see. I'm running out of time, it looks like, so I, I do want to just very briefly touch on PRP. I think PRP does do something. We don't know exactly why yet. Is it that it has the proper inflammatory mechanism in that? area, we don't know. Does the concentration of PRP make a difference? We don't actually know yet. But what you do want to inject, and again, if you're seeing social media, there's a lot of nonsense that's on there. You want to look for this lovely golden color, not something that's red. If it's red, it has a lot of the blood vessels inside there. And again, for the mechanism of action, it makes sense in terms of where the inflammatory process is and where the cell proliferation is. Right? With that, I'm going to be happy to answer any questions. I'm going to give you my I think a way to connect with me. Okay, sorry. But we can ask questions online with this app. So you can connect with me, you can DM me anytime, and I'm happy to answer any questions. So with that, we go to break, I think. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you for having me. That was great. Thanks, Thanks Jeff.